Welcome back to Turpentine VC, a podcast where we discuss the art and science of building successful venture firms, VC to VC. This episode is with Scott Belsky, angel investor, chief strategy officer at Adobe, and founder of Behance. In this conversation, which was recorded in 2021, we dive into Scott's early investments in companies like Pinterest and Uber, the evolution of his investment philosophy, principles he acquired over time, and more. We have a full full house here. We're very lucky to have uh, Scott Belsky, who many of you who many of you know uh, well, and many of you know, and uh, and no, it needs no introduction. But I'll just for for anyone who, who may not be as familiar is a, a, a prolific uh, angel investor, uh, chief product officer at Adobe, uh, founder of of Behance, and also spent uh, uh, spent some time at, at Benchmark as a as a venture partner for for a few years. So Scott, by, by way of introduction, why don't you sort of introduce the beginnings of your angel investment journey, of your angel journey? Some people are, are pros here. Some people are are starting out. You you invested in Pinterest. You invested in Uber. You invested in, in a bunch of others. What, what were your first few years of angel investing like? And and what was your uh, philosophy and, and learning curve in, in doing it? Well, it's really, you know, from a from a product and founder perspective. So I started Behance back in 2005. We were bootstrapped for about five or so years. And we got venture backing at that point. And, um, and then after two more years, seven years in, that's when we were acquired by Adobe. But in that last two years, you know, after five years of doing this, I had met, you know, a group of other product oriented founders. And then at the time, you know, I had a really good grasp of the design community and the design world, given the role that Behance was playing. And so companies that were either design driven, their product was design driven, or they had a design founder, or they're looking to hire great designers, um, I would try to help my friends out. Ben Silverman uh, asked me to be a, um, a product advisor for Pinterest when he was just pivoting from something else into what became known as Pinterest. And uh, and so I, I joined him as a product advisor. And then when he was raising his seed round, which back then he was a $5 million valuation, but which now seems small. But back then, you know, for this small little image-based bookmarking site in the world of Delicious and all these other sites. I was like, I don't know, should I do this? You know, should I put money in? I shouldn't be investing in anything. I'm the founder and like barely, you know, make my own salary. But um, that was my first angel investment and started working with him and the team on, uh, on, on product stuff and, you know, right out of the gate. And, uh, you know, and then I then started in the New York ecosystem coming across other entrepreneurs that were friends and helping them either as a product advisor or, or investor Another strange, crazy story is that my uh, my third investment ever was um, the second one didn't work out. So we won't talk about that one. The third one, I had, Behance had a big partnership with this company called StumblePod, which most of us remember. And Garrett Kant had just bought StumblePod back from eBay. He had sold it to eBay and then he had bought it back. And Behance and StumblePod were doing a big partnership together. And he was in my office, which was also my apartment back then in 2000 and. I forget the date, but you know, it was after Pinterest. And he literally whips out a sketch pad and is showing me this like side project he's working on to like help summon a car. And he's like, Do you wanna do you wanna help? And I'm like, dude, you just bought back your company, eBay, and you should be focused and I should be focused. <laughs> and then um, yeah, but then I became uh just someone who would look at his prototypes and help with the early brand of what became Uber. And so that was, you know, that was the process of getting involved with, with Uber in the early days. So I think that my lesson learned has been, I, I, at least for me, I haven't focused on looking for investments for the sake of it as much as like following my product compass, you know, and the people and the problems and the products that I have affinity towards has been like a good guiding force for me. If you, uh, if you didn't invest in Pinterest or Uber, you would have had the biggest FOMO uh, ever. Oh yeah, right. I mean, you know, having been able to be there and not, you know, I wrote a very, very, very tiny check into Uber because again, I had no idea what the hell was going on. So, um, but I, but not complaining. And you know, since then, it's been just great to um, to work with a ton of different design oriented founders or products and companies, and now you know, probably almost a hundred companies at this point, and then different plays, you know, throughout. Sometimes it was direct to consumer play. You know, Neil, Neil, Neil Blumenthal and Dave were, you know, they were uh, Warby Parker, but they were New York City entrepreneurs, you know, so I met them through this ecosystem here. 
And, you know, then early AI companies is going to go hyper science, another New York company. So New York has always been, you know, one area where I try to, you know, be especially tuned in. But at this point, it's obviously, uh, you know, both coasts and beyond. Yeah. So you, you've been doing this for, for nearly a decade, m- maybe more. How would you say you've evolved as you sort of professionalized as an, as an investor a bit, the biggest sort of like principles you've picked up or as you sort of think about your non-obvious, you know, operating principles as a, as an angel uh, today, uh, w- w- what comes to mind? Well, I think a couple litmus tests, if you will, you know, one to me is with people that I hire and work with or people that I invest in is just that idea of every conversation being a, almost a step function more interesting than the one before it as opposed to having the same conversation twice. I like to try to talk to a founder more than once if I can, because that tells me something very quickly. I mean, Periscope was a good example of that. Like Kevon and Joe, every time we started to jam about what you know they were calling something else before per- Bounty Act was a step function more interesting than the one before it. And then in the chemistry just felt so good. I was like, I want to be a part of this. I, I feel like that's such a good signal. Also, you know, seeing how someone thinks through product, you know, is great. You know, it's one thing to see a prototype and click through yourself, but to be walked through and ask questions about why certain decisions were made, I feel like you can you can unearth so much. And I do believe every product is ultimately a representation of its team. And I think that even you know, in my day job now at Adobe, where there's you know at least a dozen or so products in my organization, the products themselves almost look like their team. And I don't know if it's like we see a dog and it looks like its owner and we like play that psychological association game that may be bullshit, but I actually do believe that, you know, a a product is a manifestation of its team. And so if you can get to know the product alongside the team at the same time, you start to draw some of those connections. Yeah. One thing that some people are, 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 are thinking here is, is where exactly do they fit in as an investor? Are, you know, are they an operator who angel invests on the side? Do they join or start a, a, a firm in, in some capacity? You've explored that in, in different contexts with your you, you role at Benchmark you, you, as, as an angel. Um, you could have obviously you, you started your, your own fund. Um, h- how have you thought about frameworks for thinking about what's the best fit for you and any advice you'd give for other people about what, what, is, what it makes the most sense in terms of what capacity to become an investor? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, let's talk about it in two different ways. So let's talk about first in terms of the market, where the market's going. And what founders want, and then let's talk about it in terms of you know us as individuals, you know, and finding our kind of power lane or power alley, so to speak, in terms of what we're especially good at. But in the market, founders want to be surrounded by people that have empathy for what they're going through. They want to be surrounded by people that are maybe less generalists and more super superpowers in specific areas. You know, as a founder, there's so many moments where you're lost, where you're facing uncertainty or ambiguity. And you want to have someone specifically who you can contact to walk you through it. And as a founder myself, you know, folks like Chris Dixon, you know, he was, he helped me walk through my cap chart the morning, the night before the acquisition and like, and see like what equity I might want to shift in various places to make certain people whole. And he had done this himself. And so, you know, that, that I think that people want to look for that. And you know, these days when you have all these like very large funds that can essentially be valuation agnostic and just get in early as an option for themselves to get in later. And um, and also just the plethora of new funds. I mean, there's just so much capital in the ecosystem and anyone who doesn't know better will basically invest in anything that has all the right buzzwords. So I, I think that being a an operator investor, you know, is a competitive advantage these days. You know, I've seen it time and time again where a round will be full, but there's always space for that operator with a background in a specific area that's going to be crucial for that company to succeed. So I think that, you know, when I see my you know, friends who are great operators suddenly say, oh, I have to join a fund or I have to start a fund. In some ways, I almost see them as taking themselves off of the market of what they could have been competitive in. You know, had they just kind of stayed investing in their own name and in very small checks, maybe they would have gotten every piece of deal flow from their community and they would have been able to invest in anything they wanted. And now suddenly they're just making it more competitive for themselves. So for those of you that are operators or are thinking of, you know, investing in your own name, you know, with in, in a spear fishing like manner using your superpower, that's where the greatest opportunity is right now in this space. 
as for individuals, you know, and what we what we love doing, you know, I, I, I mean, one thing I learned at Benchmark is I don't believe that venture capital is like a very scalable uh, offering. I think that the best firms are boutiques. You know, they're they're non they're not efficient in certain ways on purpose. Um, as soon as you have someone making the agenda for you in partner meetings, all bets are off as far as I'm concerned, because then you're not you're leveraging the forces of natural selection to determine what you should actually be talking with with your partners. As soon as you're dealing with you know operations and talking about the firm's website and all these other mechanics, all bets are off in my view, because you're not focusing enough on what actually moves the needle, which is finding that one great deal and then making that founder succeed. You know, so I think that as individuals, we have to kind of find uh, you know the construct that works works for us, um, and the you know the the superpower that we bring to the market that no one else has. And also, you know, last thing I would just say is curiosity. It's you know whenever I'm not sure whether to work with someone or whether to invest in something or whatever, it's just like what am I insanely curious about? And if it's something I'm really curious about, it typically ends up being a good learning experience, if nothing more. And one of the things that I think you learned from our conversation or I gathered, that I gathered from our conversations is that you're more excited about or you gravitate more towards the pre-momentum than the, than the post-momentum. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, listen, I mean, I, I've invested in Series A, Series B before. And typically I see it as paying the price for missing it earlier. But also it's just something that, I, you know, if it's something I really love or it's a team I really love, I'll do it. But I, you know, I like... I, I like thinking about the potential of a product and the potential of a team. Whereas I think, you know, great investors, probably way better than I, are more focused on the present, you know, and what's the current state of the team and the current state of the product. And they're probably making a risk adjusted better and better bet, you know, than I am. But I just love, you know, that early stage. I think it's so fun. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Hey everyone, Eric here. At Turpentine, we're building the first media outlet for tech people by tech people. We're the network behind the show you're listening to right now. We have a slate of hit shows across a range of topics and industries, from our AI and investing cluster of podcasts, to shows that drive the conversation in tech with the most interesting thinkers, founders, investors, and influencers, like Econ 102 with Noah Smith. We're launching new shows every week, and we're looking for industry-leading sponsors. If you think that might be you and your company, email me at erikaturpentine.co. That's E-R-I-K at turpentine.co, and let's partner together. You've also, you've incubated a company, you've been an executive company, you've founded a company. How have you sort of come around just more broadly, uh, because a lot of people here are also just thinking about, you know, long-term, what they want to do, where they best fit in where you best fit in and, and what, why being executive Adobe relative to all the other things you could be doing was, is the right. Yeah. Thing. You know, it's, it took me years to figure this out and I learned the hard way. The answer was a seven year journey. Right. And then three years at Adobe leading the hands, but also leading a lot of the transition from creative cloud, from software to service. I had a great time, but everyone was telling me, dude, you should be an investor. You should be an investor. You should be an investor. And then when you have the opportunity to join a firm like benchmark, as general partner, it's like, I should probably do this. And then immediately, you know, three to six weeks later, I felt like I'd hung up my spurs. I had felt like uh, I was listening to like Johnny Cash music, you know, and it was just not a good sign because I was in my 30s and I just felt like I wasn't using my superpowers anymore. So what I realized is that actually having a big team and operating was always stressful. And then as soon as I was no longer doing it, I realized how much of me was you know, engaged by that. I missed it. So I kind of believe that happiness is feeling fully utilized. And to me, that means, you know, 30% of me feeling utilized with friendships and family, you know, 30% of me feeling utilized with the investing stuff and, and being able to help teams build products and build businesses. And, you know, the rest of me, just building products myself, building teams. I'm not doing a time breakdown. I'm doing more of a happiness breakdown. You know, feeling fully utilized means using all these muscles in unison. And so that's why, you know, some people might say, oh, it's a little weird of a hybrid, you know, doing this investing thing and also the leading products of a big company. You know, why would you be doing that? But for some reason, at the end of the day, it makes me feel really fulfilled. What advice um, do you have for founders 
who or, or people who want to incubate companies and, and, be, and be chairman of them, but but aren't the sort of day to day CEO based on your your experience doing that a, a few years ago. Yep. Yeah. Sure. And you know, I studied this. I've tried it, and I've thought a lot about it. I'll tell you, you know, watching watching Garrett with Uber taught me a few things. Number one is you have to be obscenely generous in order to be a co-founder who's not operating and a board chairman in his case, um, and truly empower a team to succeed. And I've seen a few examples of this fail where someone says, oh no, I'm going to retain this much equity because it was my idea. And uh, and then the company breaks down, you know, those cases. With, um, with Garrett, it was for him all about setting up the right people to succeed. And he knew that having much less ownership of a business that was worth billions would obviously be more valuable than half ownership or whatever of something that was you know worth nothing. So I think that you have to have that attitude of knowing that you know ideas are worth nothing really. And um, you can start, you can have an idea, and then if you build a founding team around it, you know, be be extra generous. And so there's never a doubt that they have that it's theirs and not yours, you know, and then do everything you can to empower and help them succeed. And um you know, that's what I would try to do in that scenario. Incubations are tough because listen, these are living, breathing entities. And companies are like children. They need to feel like they have devoted parents. You know, they need to feel they need to get all the nourishment and and you know, and otherwise they'll get they'll be screwed up. Yeah, I've heard from this um someone I'm actually forgetting his name. He co-founded Long Game with Lindsay Holden. He he's co-founded a few companies. He's a professor at Stanford. One of his advice was basically that you have to have like one core value prop that's very hard to hard to replace and, and sort of justifies. And so maybe it's, you could bring a lot of capital in the case of like Josh Kushner or, or Keith Raboy, or maybe it's in his case, he has, you know, relationships with, with, uh, with banks that mm. uh, merit sort of that, that equity because he's getting the first customers and stuff like that. Yeah. It's interesting. Going back to your point around um, evaluating the market, I'm curious to get your sense for how you think that's going to change in the years to come. Like, for example, do you see the future as like, you know, rounds being put together. It's like one lead firm and then it's all, you know, operator angels. And like, is it, is it sort of a barbell? Are you long in the solo capitalist trend or how, how do you sort of think things evolve in the next few years? Oh, well, you know, there's a couple of companies that I've been a part of recently. They're rounds that are second time entrepreneurs who are really well respected and known. And they just did, they just raised their seed round from individuals only. And, uh, and usually one individual with a larger check set the terms and then everyone else just followed. And then for their Series A, they went to meet with a lot of great firms. They got a, a term sheet from Sequoia and they met a few others. And they decided, you know what? We're just going to do another inside round with the exact same people. And so they came back to us and said, do you want to do a round at a much higher valuation? But others, you know, uh, were really like, there were a number of people that still were able to write very big checks. And, and so, you know, we continue to do it that way. And I think that you're seeing more and more of that because if you're an experienced entrepreneur, you you know, not to say that firms don't add value, they do, but if you can go to a hand-selected group of people who know you and you know them and who are capable of writing larger checks and you don't have to bring on a board member um, if you don't want to, you have a little more authority, I mean, maybe, maybe people will just do that. And so there'll be a positive selection bias, you know, for some of the best, best companies potentially. And so I do think that being in the position where you can do that, I mean, in this case, funds were basically not even allowed to participate. So you had to almost be an individual angel or a you know super small solo capitalist type fund to to really, I guess, you know, in their eyes at least, be part of this. That's an extreme, and I'm not suggesting that that's the norm. But I do I do agree with what you kind of postulated, which is that you'll have more situations where one firm leads and then they'll just round it out with a lot of value added individuals. And, and if you're the, the, the folks that are going to suffer are the people who don't have a superpower or maybe just from the finance world who have a venture capital fund with money, you know, and, and I call that harmless capital. You know, there's a lot of harmless capital in the system right now. It's just people who will write a check and just, you know, stay out of your way. You know that there'll be a negative selection bias for that for those dollars. How do you think about being a thematic investor or, or going deep on spaces or, or getting uh, up to speed on on certain things? H- how do you approach that? 
And are there certain spaces you're excited about right now? Yeah, yeah, there are. And I mean, I think I go from, I go on whims, you know, or I'll get super excited about a certain concept. And uh, I mean, right now I'm really interested in this vertically integrated services idea where you essentially um, for small businesses. So basically you go out there, you train people to be repair people of, uh, you know, to repair certain types of appliances. And then you set them up as a business in their geography to repair those appliances and you generate the leads for them and you process payments for them and you do marketing and SEO for them. You do everything for them. So it's almost like the reverse franchise model where people don't come to you, but you go to them and you basically build this. And in exchange, you take 7% of their revenue forever. And I've seen this now at a few different spaces. And it's really interesting to me. You know, I'm really interested in this SMB, very like micro SMB trend right now. One company I invest in called Cash Drop. It's almost like a Shopify, but for super, super simple, like think taco trucks and that kind of thing. And, you know, just cleaning up the space because they have some very novel, you know, no fee ways of doing this that are really interesting. So there are these little themes that I'll pick up on and I'll get obsessed with and I'll try to meet, you know, the rest of the players in the space. But I try not to ever define myself by a thesis because the thesis is always changing. Yeah. And, you know, and they get old quickly. We, the company you incubated was it was it was in a similar space to the the spaces that you're exploring right now, right? So you've been curious about this space for a while. Can you talk about? Yeah, sure. So this is also you know one of those big things that did not work out. So prefer, so prefer the idea of prefer was was to help people get referrals for every service professional in their lives from their friends, and so the idea being that you will trust if I tell you there's a chef or there is a hair stylist or there is a massage therapist or there's you know, any service provider actually that you would ever need that you might find online with 4.2 4. stars from strangers, you'll actually potentially irrationally always trust what I have to say over whatever the average online says. We just are, as human behavior, we just always go to friends for the referrals for everything. And when you go to any of the moms groups on Facebook, for example, it's a constant exchange of, oh, I need a babysitter or I need a tutor. I need a this and you that toilet trainer, or, you know, whatever the case is. It's, it's all a referral frenzy. But the thing is, is it's not, there's no structured product that helps us know the services that our friends use. And so the idea being that if you showed me all of your service providers, and I showed you all of mine compounded by 50 you know, then it would actually, we'd have a full index of every service provider fully vetted by our friends that would, you know, fuel our lives and our needs for services. And so what ended up happening together, I put together a team, you know, I was uh, just a board member and, um, but I put together a great team and the team explored this. We launched the first version of the product that actually was working extremely well, but had no growth mechanics other than like the manual old school growing in on with a field game. And so uh, the team was also, you know, our, our CEO was from Facebook and from the growth mindset, you know, and so it was very important to the team that they found that kind of like, you know, viral growth mechanic from within the product. So you wouldn't rely on a field, uh, on, a, on a ground team. And so, um, you know, there were like three or four different pivots off of that. You know, the team, I, I've, I've shared this publicly and, you know, the team and I talk about it, uh, still quite a bit. You know, my view is that maybe we should have kept at that first iteration more because it was actually people still come up to me and are like, I wish I had that back, but it wasn't growing. Like, I wonder if we should have rather than pivoting off of it, just like kept tweaking the, you know, the mechanics for get it to become more shareable. Yeah, it's just hard to know when to when, when to change and when to keep going. Your 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 first example of sort of the reverse. What do you call it? reverse what? Reverse franchise model. It's almost like uh, YC for the trades or something. Like, are, are, are you, so it, you see it as, as education and then, you know, sort of job job placement or, or, or lead generation? Well, there are a few ways of going about it. And yet another team doing that is basically going to, you know, like painters that are out there that have their own mom and pop painting shops, right? And these painters and geographies all across the country and presumably the world you know, these painters, they do, you know, they may, they may make 150 to 300, maybe a million dollars a year for their like painting business. 
but they have no payments technology. They have no, they don't know what SEO or SEM even means. You know, they definitely don't have a social media presence. They don't have any reminders, CRM management tools for their customer base, no referral engines, like nothing, right? And so if you go to one of these companies and you say, here's the deal, I'm going to turn you into one of my fran- one of my franchises. So basically I'm going to reverse, you're already, you're already an operating company. I'm going to turn you into a franchise of my like parent name. And so instead of Bob's painting, it's now like XYZ Bob's painting. And in exchange, I'm going to do all this back in for you. I'm going to fuel your business. And I'm going to show you that you're going to actually grow 20 to 25% based on what I'm going to do for you. And I'm going to take 7% revenue going forward. Then it's a good value proposition for everyone. And so that's, you know, that's one model. Another model is to actually go and find these people and train them up and then basically light them up on your platform as a business from day one, but you having like trained them to do the craft as opposed to them having already done it. One company we co-invested in together uh, a bunch of years ago is, is was Greg Eisenberg's company Islands, which is yes. a messaging company. Um, maybe it was too too ahead of its time. How how have you sort of um, thought about uh, consumer social o- over time, and and where are we at now, and uh, how are you viewing it as an investor? Well, you know, consumer social is probably one of those forever themes for me, just because built community building and social is a big part of you know my interest area. And, you know, there are always quirky ideas at first, as you know, and there are always an understanding of a user's psychology and like what they're trying to do. And, you know, that's what I love about social products is there's so many nuances, like ego analytics, you know, how does someone feel better about themselves proactively from the product as a result of using the product and all these other principles that I think are fascinating. You know, they're also, of course, notoriously and increasingly hard to build just because, a, the growth tax that worked for the earlier versions of them are no longer either acceptable or legal. Um, number two is um, is the walled gardens obviously are really powerful now and Facebook has you know, become very like dominant in the way that it flexes its muscle in this space. And, uh, you know, but I actually think that new mediums are a new opportunity. You know, I'm looking at some social stuff in the AR space and looking at uh, audio social stuff I'm also, uh, you know, thinking about what's kind of the next, you know, personal human need that will be fulfilled by that technology. Yeah, there's, there's you know, a great social product when it comes out. You, you can't imagine life before it, whether it was Twitter or even not even Clubhouse. Not you can't imagine life before it, but just it's so elegant. It work, works so well. A couple of spaces within that that I've, I've been excited about to, to look for is one is like, is there some version of a discord for sports? Uh, yeah. Sports fans are just so you know, engaged, they, they're willing to pay as, as sort of the athletic has shown. And is there an experience? I don't know if it's audio sort of play by play around the game or, 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 or whatever it is, but it seems like that's something interesting. And then I, I've always wondered if there was something that could be done off of re- receipts um, mm-hmm. or this new data source in general, whether it's email or, or receipts that you could create a, you know, that you could create an identity around, you know, the things you support, the things. Well, it's Venmo like, but in like a different, you know, more more scaled context and more right. center of gravity. Yeah, I think Venmo could have done a lot more with the feed, but also imagine Venmo if you also had a personal profile that was like your yep. your angelist profile, but it's like here's the restaurant I support or here's the yeah. causes I believe in or, or or yeah. I mean, one of the things I was excited about with with, um, with Greg Eisenberg's with Islands is uh, the which he never really like did as much, but we talked about it was the constraints around the channels that people could join these islands that people could join and so making making little rules like if you're in a group this group you can only post photos or this group you can only post five words every message must be five words you know or this group you can only post your receipts you know and you can automatically you know trigger it connect it to your credit card and it just posts things from your receipts but imagine like an at scale social experience with friends with these constraints, which as we know, fuel creativity. I mean, that people love that stuff. You know, Webby's were notorious and they had five word acceptance speeches and it became kind of like viral as a result. So I think there's some fun ideas there, you know, in terms of, uh, yeah, new, 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 new kind of rules for, for yeah. messaging. New, new constraints for, for sure. The, the, the other thing I, I want to exist is basically quantifying fandom in a better way. So if mm-hmm. I'm like, one of the first users of Stratechery, uh, just a, a, a blog people are passionate about or, or whatever it is, 
or this new band or this new whatever, I can sort of, you know, claim my, like get a collectible. It's like claim my, it's almost like four square for the internet in, in, in an interesting way. Um, it's, uh, reminds me of the one, what was the, uh, Seeky's business? Oh, famous where you could buy and own and, and, and it would be stolen away from you. But the identities right. of all these famous people and brands, which of course got shut down, but yeah. it's an amazingly fun thing. <laughs> yeah. When I got shut down. Yeah, there, there's definitely something there. Morgan DM'd me a question. Morgan, would you like to ask it? Hey, Stan. I liked hearing Eric like do a quick Shark Tank round with you, though, for all the ideas that he's been thinking about. So I don't want to interrupt that. But I will ask a question. So what's a product or company that has failed in the past that you think it was a timing thing? And if it was to pop up today, it might have a chance. I mean, Prefer definitely is up there. I'm still looking for someone to do this. Uh, that I'm biased on that one, though, of course. Let me think. It's a tough It's a tough business model, but Circa. Does everyone remember Circa, the news app? Beautifully designed product, Matt uh, Galligan. The idea was you could follow a story. And think about it, actually. To this day, if you read a story in the news anywhere, you can't follow it and know what happens next which is wild to me because news is like one of the most popular formats of media. And, uh, and everyone always wants to know what happens next in any series, television show or movie. So that was their simple insight that they had was you could follow a story. They never really nailed it. And also never, for whatever reason, didn't catch on. Yeah, it was widely, but um, that's another one. I think the timing was wrong. I think that there wasn't, I don't know, the graph wasn't there. They weren't as plugged in as they could have been now for social media. You know, it just wasn't there yet. So I'll keep thinking about it. Did you have a take on HQ trivia or just sort of live video on the internet more broadly? Well, from the Periscope days, you know, I learned that was a very engaging format, you know, that, and I talked to Russ at, at HQ, you know, quite a bit about, you know, the retention issue and some ideas around how do you have a, a vanity metric that survives the game? Because to me, people... I always like to say the dirty little secret about products like Instagram is you go in more to see who saw your content than to see other people's content. And so if you keep scrolling that out, you know, it's really about accumulating this social value that you can then project to the world about something you're great at, you know, or something you love or you're passionate about. And that's why these metrics matter. You know, how many points you have, how many discoveries you've made, how many followers you have, how many likes this. I mean, we hate to admit it as humans, but it's true. You know, this stuff is, these are, these are those ego analytics I mentioned at the beginning. With HQ Trivia, the question was like, how can you become a, a bona fide superstar? And how can you also have that scale? Like, you know, the, your, your score and how could everyone in their own little group of friends have a leaderboard? And it becomes just like, you know, um, this, you know, thing that it ultimately retains you over time. But any any product I find that, you know, starts all over again every single time, I guess Fortnite's is probably an exception to that, although there's some things that accumulate there. But um, yeah, that was one thought I had around that experience. Can, can you flesh out ego analytics a little bit more in terms of like what, what if you really understand that concept, what new ideas could come to mind? Or, or, or I've never heard that term. Can you just share more about it? Yeah, so it's, I think it's about, um, you know, one of my favorite, product slogans is from Dave Marin, who once told me the devil's in the default. And I use that all the time because I think it's all that matters in product experiences and in helping a user succeed. And in the default experience, can you help the customer know how successful they're being in your product? And so that could mean anything from a, you know, seeing your number of followers and likes or whatever else. You know, on Behance, we would show people the graphs of their of their appreciations that they got of their projects and their view count, and you know, and and those really drove engagement because people started feeling momentum and velocity. And it goes back to um, I remember a professor of, of mine at Harvard Business School, Teresa Mabale, did this huge study in organizations around creativity, and the whole study basically yields this insight that progress begets progress that people have to feel like they're making progress in order to make more progress. And so as we have teams, and if we're not merchandising the progress our teams are making back to the team, they'll feel lost. They'll feel like they're in the back of a car with the windows blacked out and they don't know if they've made any, you know, any movement uh, along the journey. And so 
in some ways in the product, we have to make the customer feel like they're making progress. And that's to me like ego analytics is a tool to do that. Yes, sir. Hey, Scott, uh, thanks so much for doing this. Um, my name is David. I, I run a coding boot camp. I'm curious your thoughts on what the future of, or, you know, is there anything past the resume, past the portfolio, past the GitHub that, you know, better connects, you know, people who with skills to employers? Yeah. I mean, one thing I'm really excited about is the power of attribution in creativity and it extends itself to development as well. I mean, it's pretty amazing that we can't go to any website and see hidden in the code exactly who did what. I mean, think about what that would do for developers' careers. If you go to any website and see exactly who did what for that technology, you can do it in a movie. If you're watching a movie, the credits will tell you who the first grip and the second grip and that you know, every single person who was involved with the movie gets attribution and therefore opportunity in their careers based on how well the movie performed. And we don't have that yet for any digital creations. And so I think about that a lot from both the developers. Wow, I'd want to go register a domain like devcreditroll.com or something. That's, there a, you that's, go. that's an amazing idea. I just they, I, I never thought about it that my resume is a bunch it's of lines. I can't, it's not a portfolio that I can just say, hey, I did, you know. Right. Uh, and if you get a plugin that exposes that information to every website and digital experience you ever encounter. And in one fell swoop, you could have full attribution of every designer and developer on the planet, everyone oh. could insert in the code. And you'd have career meritocracy because maybe people would find I mean, that would be the most data. viral thing because I'm sure every developer, if some like NPM or, you know, user package managers, and then you, uh, you're absolutely right because 90% of develop- developers aren't open source developers, right? Just I'm sure like 90% of designers don't get their name in the X no. data or something. Which right? is just, and that's just like a cultural thing because there's no need, there's no reason for that not to be the case. I mean, one thing we just did. In, in Photoshop two weeks ago, as we launched this new thing called C- the Content Authenticity Initiative, which one purpose of it is to help people know, you know, if a piece of content was edited. So there's like a, you know, a sort of a, a fake fake media play there of helping you know people know what they can trust. But then the other part of it was actually just fostering attribution and work, because essentially we can make it so that anyone who does anything in one of our tools, like Photoshop, can have that kind of work attributed back to them for career opportunities. So, you know, I think that there's definitely inroads here that we could make. I think it would be a big, big deal. Awesome. That's it. Well, why have you uh, incubated this company, Scott? Oh, it's on my list. Believe me, I have a very long list of these crazy ideas. <laughs> Brian? Yeah, I was just kind of thinking the uh, the reverse of Morgan's question would be interesting, too. If you, you talked about some things that you're excited about. I'm curious to hear what are some things that you're bearish on? And is there a particular macro trend that will potentially pull the markets away from that current trend that's hot right now? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, let's, let's put it this way. I think that uh, video is, we're over-indexing on video as it relates to the future at work. I actually don't think the future at work has that much to do with video. So I'm probably in the minority on that, but it's a inefficient, judgmental, superficial, self-conscious format. And it's, uh, you know, and it's synchronous as opposed to asynchronous. And it's just, uh, and it and also drives us crazy by the end of the day. So I think there's going to be something greater than that. Um, that's also going to be assisted by intelligence. You know, you want to you wanna have the conversations with people that matter. And you also want to have conversations you didn't know you needed. You want some spontaneity as a service. Um, and so I feel like those are some of the more interesting trends, you know, in that space. I, I'm, I'm notoriously bearish on productivity tools. Uh, my view is that just like there, everyone focuses on the switching costs of productivity tools and the fact that once you get someone in productivity tool that they won't want to leave. But you've seen the migration from Trello to the other clubhouse to, you know, others, you know, it's like keeps going on and on. And I think what that's, symbolic of is the fact that there's actually switching benefits as opposed to switching costs. When we take over a project as a program manager, a project manager, it's like, oh, okay, I got to do some spring cleaning here. Let me go through our, our our inventory of tickets and clean it up. Oh, and by the way, let's try this new tool. There's this notion of like novelty breeds utility or, and, and, and loyalty. You know, when you feel attracted to a new system, when you're excited by it, you get like reinvigorated in the project. We switch our own tools occasionally, you know, actually more than occasionally. So 
I, I really wonder if these productivity tools, if there's ever like really in the modern day, like a winner take all mindset. I mean, maybe Basecamp was really smart to remain a small, mostly private company that just distributes cash, you know, to its owners because maybe it shouldn't be a venture back business. Vic. So Scott, hey, thanks uh, for joining us today. Um, you talked about you and you and Eric had both talked about this idea of all these you know solo investors, small investors, boutique investors coming in or raising around from them instead of kind of some of the bigger houses. And I've seen some of my friends do that as well. How does that work exactly? So let's say you raise from like eighty solo investors. How does the founder extract value from each of those investors? And how do how does an investor like you, when you're pooled with so many? How do you find space to give insight and input when there could be maybe five or 10 of you with similar, right? Similar superpowers, not the exact same. Can you, can you talk through that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Well, typically these, you know, these rounds that, that I, that I'm involved in at least are typically, you know, seven to 12 investors. So it's not, you know, it's not 80 and it's not like a, you know, big uh, pool of, um, you know, of, of very small investments. I think though that, I mean, you asked a really good question about the way that uh, an entrepreneur uses his or her investors and how, you know, how you do it. I feel most used in a good way. You know, when the teams are coming to me being like, you know, I want 30 minutes to run through something specific and they'll like tell me, and sometimes they'll even send me like a notion document or a prototype to review and, you know, beforehand. And it's like the most power 30 to 60 minutes you know, ever. And, um, and they'll ask pointed questions. I actually did this this morning with them, um, with the pitch team in uh, Germany. Uh, they were thinking through something in their project roadmap and they came like a week ago, Christian emailed me. He's like, this is a specific thing I want your insight on. And they got on and on the dot, they were the, the, the team, the key team was there and we like ran through it. Uh, so that, yeah, that's a good feeling. Cause I feel like I can add value and they see, and you know, they, they know exactly what I'm useful for. And I think they'll also ask their investors, like, what do you, what do you, how do you help your teams? Like, how, how are you most helpful? And it's good, you know, to, um, to have a specific list to give of things you can do. So I think that's part of, you know, that's part of it is asking the right questions up front, you know, being very descriptive, et cetera. And as an investor, it's good to like manage expectations and tell your team, like, these are the few things I would be interested in. Like when I talk to these data science type products, um, some of which I'm an investor and I'm like, listen, I'm never going to help you on the data science side of this. So like, you know, I'm going to hurt you if you ask me those questions. I'm ready to do the bad answers. But, you know, these are the things that I think I can do. Clearly helps. Maybe including your, Scott, just looking towards the, the future. I know one thing you're, you're thinking a lot about is the uh, the, the future of, of, of creativity. What what is that? Uh, what does that mean to you? Yeah. I mean, it's another um, it's another interesting space these days, you know, both in the venture world there are a lot of cool new companies. Um, you know, I, you know, and again, I'm obviously biased because I, you know, I've seen the, um, I've, I've just been part of the Adobe DNA for a while. But um, first of all, every new medium falls flat unless it's filled with incredible, interactive, you know, unbelievable creativity. The web didn't take off until that was there. Mobile didn't take off until that was there. And the same thing will be for the world of augmented reality you know, and to some extent, virtual reality, like you need to outfit creatives to contribute and do that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of really cool stuff happening in that space that I'm really excited about. Um, I also think that the the days of desktop software, there you're like kind of imprisoned to a desktop system and files is, is, is also old. And so, you know, that's why I focus with the teams. I'm bringing Photoshop and now cloud documents. You know, if you're publishing Photoshop documents to the cloud, you can pick up on iPad and you can imagine that extends to other platforms and, you know, other places where you'd want to do creativity over time. So I think that you'll creativity will be a platform agnostic services first, you know, in the cloud experience that enables all kinds of collaboration and, you know, uh, integrations that we, you know, can only fathom right now. It's really cool. And the other thing I would say about this whole creativity space is that what are humans got to do? You know, we're, we've got like, we're kind of effed, you know, everything's going to be replaced by AI. You know, every job is essentially at risk to some extent. And I think humans are going to have to do the things that only humans can do. And chief among them is to express yourself visually, you know, to be creative and stand out at work, to be creative and stand out on social, to be a content creator. And so creativity tools are suddenly in vogue 
you know, the top of our funnel is so different now than it was 10 years ago at Adobe. It's unbelievable. Like people are just coming in from everywhere. And uh, of course, we need new tools and new experiences, new interfaces for sure to accommodate these people because products like After Effects are freaking hard. You know, there's steep learning curves for a lot of these products. But that's exciting. I think that's like one of the biggest opportunities. I think there will be a lot of companies that win, you know, that space. And then last one, just because it's on on, on path. Uh, Sharos, do, do you want to ask? Sure. Hey, how are we going to creatively collaborate in this remote world? I'm having such a hard time not being able to whiteboard. Yeah, I know. It's, I mean, the good news is there's like a million companies thinking about it right now. That is the, they're not there yet, right? I, I don't know. I, maybe I'm too, I, I'm an optimist on this front. I feel like uh, the constraints we're living under right now are going to fuel so many creative solutions to this that we would never have had otherwise. I think that we're being kind of, we're missing the forest for the trees by being in Zoom all day. You know, there's different places we need to be and be doing. So I, you're not in your head. I think we agree on that. I'm with you. And I'm looking. As you think about the downsides of your ego analytics framework, right? Addiction, yeah. humans becoming yeah. zombies. Do you see a world where tech embraces consumer products that have different ways of creating value in a way that makes a human whole again, or just something other than addiction? I, you know, I feel like we need to use some of the same tools that hurt us to help us. I mean, one great example is Apple's, you know, um, new like kind of timing technologies. And you, you know, and when you start to see your screen time, then you start to reduce it because, but that's ego analytics playing, you know, it's the same tool. It's just using it to train good behavior as opposed to entice bad behavior. So, you know, I feel like we're, you know, we're, we're governed, we're governed by short-term rewards. We have dopamine, whether we like it or not, you know, and I, I just hope that as designers of experiences, we can leverage those reflexes for good. And, have you um, seen anything yeah. yet? that you're excited about that's maybe in the early stages on that front. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think I've seen, you know, I, I mean, almost all the designers I know are actually thinking about this right now. And they're, you know, they're, they're, they're thinking about how you can reduce cognitive load you know, how you can, I mean, even when I talk to, you know, friends at these big social platforms that are the most guilty of this, they are asking the right questions. They're like, well, what if we remove the like, what would happen? Let's run a test and let's see. You know, what if we, you know, hit this by default as opposed to show it? And would that change behavior and how would it change behavior? So I think we're, I think people are sorry, people are awoken to it. They're just not, we haven't cracked it yet. And listen, practically speaking, it's hard. I mean, companies are not going to change their product overnight in a way that creators their business. They're going to have to test their way into it, but they do want to, at least the ones that I talk to. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Perfect place to, to to wrap. In a, in a second, I'm going to ask everyone to unmute your mics and uh, and give uh, Scott a, a round of applause. Scott, thanks so much for... Oh, this is awesome. Here. Eric, thanks for doing this. I'll film. Turpentine VC is a podcast from Turpentine, the network behind Moment of Zen and Econ 102. If you liked the episode, please leave a review in the Apple Store or rate us on Spotify. Thank you.